Well, just so the world can realize how dedicated the AI professionals in the world are, we have Mark from Murata, who's here on a late Saturday evening donating his time and his brain cells. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. All right. Looking forward to it. Um, I tell you what, let's start off. I'd love to know a little bit about you personally, your kind of your background, what brought you into radiation therapy, and then, then fill us in on Murata, specifically the efforts and uh, on ongoing efforts and future efforts in AI. I guess uh, my, my background's kind of very much run in parallel with Murata, actually. Um, so I, I uh, went to Oxford University as an undergraduate uh, in my sort of full fourth year master's project, I did something on uh, image segmentation for ultrasound. I thought, this is fun. I'd like to do that for a PhD. So I stuck around and did a PhD. Um, and the lab I joined, uh, there was a little spin out company called Murata Solutions that had just formed um, as I was doing my PhD. That company got um, bought by CTI and made PET scanners. And Murata back then focused on image fusion. Um, CTI then got bought by Siemens. I stuck around in academia doing a, a sort of a few postdoc positions, mostly focused on women's health and 3D ultrasound segmentation. Um, and just as I was starting to, to look to move into industry, because really I'm motivated by seeing stuff used in, in clinical practice as opposed to just you know, publishing papers. Um, Murata was having a effectively a management buyout of the Murata brand from Siemens. So it became a small independent company again. Um, and I was able to join that company sort of fairly early on as it became independent. Oh, so um, when when did that management buyout happen? What year? Uh, so it was end, end of 2008. Okay. Right at the end, yeah. So I, I joined in sort of early 2009. Uh, now Murata as part of CTI and Siemens have focused very much on image registration, image fusion, um, just prior to being bought by Siemens, Murata had actually launched a, a deformable image registration product for radiation therapy, which didn't go anywhere in Siemens. Um, and, and so pretty much as soon as the management buyout uh, had happened, then we started looking at radiation oncology again. Um, now, my, my background uh, was very much in ultrasound, uh, and Murata doesn't do any ultrasound at the moment. Um, but it's also in image segmentation and actually you know, auto contouring auto segmentation has really been my passion throughout my time at Murata. Um, and, and so uh, yeah initially we were looking at the space contouring because that used image registration um and and so the the path we've come to sort of ai based auto contouring was i had a research grant i was really keen to make atlas contouring better because it just quite frankly wasn't good enough Nobody's was. Um, and we were looking into various things about how we can make Atlas based um, you know, contouring better. And, and we got about halfway through this sort of three year grant and we concluded that actually the sort of established practice around Atlas selection just wasn't going to work. Um, we started looking at machine learning, whether we could use that for Atlas selection. We thought, well, why, why use it for Atlas selection? Let's, let's just use it directly for segmentation. So really, uh, you know, blown away at that time by the results we were getting. Um, and, and that's where we sort of moved into doing AI by, based segmentation. Um, I'm really fortunate sort of in terms of timing that we were able then to, to be the first on the market um, with a AI based auto segmentation. Well, it sounds like, you know, we're not only fortunate, don't be humble. It sounds like you were a key element of how that happened. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That's fa uh, that's fascinating. I actually want to go back to something you just said because, yeah, I'm. Uh, if you see the gray hair here, I guess it's uh, since my postdoc. It's since '97. I've been in this industry, and there was this atlas-based auto seg that started being, a you know, a hot temperature topic. I'd say early and mid 2000s just absolutely didn't work, and and a lot of it was slow. So there was clearly when when technology moved to the uh, AI and deep learning, I have been amazed at what I've seen. And it's a long time coming because uh, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but obviously it's going to make contouring more consistent. 
part of why we're here today is to focus on how we can ensure it's going to be on average more accurate and not just more consistent. Yeah. So with that particular topic, um, how what are your efforts and Murata's efforts as you not only internally develop and test new models, but as you deploy them, what kind of what are your validation strategies and your challenges and triumphs in that regard? I think it's 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 been a real sort of almost learning journey as we we've, we've gone through this process. You know, we've done the sort of standard quantitative metrics. Um, I'm on a one man campaign to eradicate dice because it's seemingly meaningless. You know, you get better dice scores, great, and then you look at it and go, but it's not useful. <laughs> um, so it's very much sort of working with the clinicians. And, and one of the things we found early on, because we were getting really good results, was how do you judge contour and quality? If, if some of these metrics, dice, house, soft distance, don't really tell you the answer, especially because you've, you've taken a ground truth, which is somebody's opinion. And, and may as well see from your, from your work, um, there's a lot of variability in what right is. Uh, so we, we started showing these uh, to the, their contours to the clinicians. Um, and, and when we're showing some of the contours, we get a lot of criticism. It's really easy. If you, if you know something's auto-contouring, um, you tend to criticize it just because, uh, I mean, it's almost like, you know, we used to at atlas contouring and needing to edit it and it being wrong. So I know it's auto-contouring and my expectation is that it's going to be wrong. So now I know it's auto-contouring. I'm just going to criticize because I can. Um, and we worked with with several clinical uh, institutions and sort of were refining models, trying to make them happy, trying to make it as good as possible. And after a while, I was getting a little bit mad, um, just yeah, with continual criticism. And, and I just I threw in one of the clinical data sets that we were training off that they've provided with us. Um, and, and lo and behold, because they thought it was the auto contouring, they started criticizing. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, that wasn't actually the auto contouring. I loaded the wrong one. It was, that it was, was your own data set. It was yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. You drew that. <laughs> and, and and then suddenly I was like, oh, okay. It turns out the auto contouring is quite good suddenly overnight. Actually, yeah, stemming from that, we we set up a, a Turing test. Which people can have a play if they like. It's at autocontouring.com, where we were we were just doing this study with um, clinical contours and auto contouring. So can you tell the difference? Now, to a trained eye, actually, you, you still can tell the difference because of the sort of artifacts that clinicians have, that auto contours have. You, you can pull out the differences, but um, again, asking around acceptance. If you ask around acceptance and you know the answer, it's kind of a, it, you get a vast result. If you, you blind people to what the contours are and then start asking them, you get some interesting answers. Yeah. Um, especially if you do multi-institution studies. You turn out that one institution will accept their own contours, but they won't accept somebody else's clinical contours. You find that AI maybe sits somewhere in the middle of sort of, it's not as good as my my own contours, but it's better than my colleagues' contours. This um, is, hey, Mark, listen, we are kindred spirits here. I've already got some notes I want to drill down on before we... Um, I apologize. When we look at your contour, uh, Murata's autoseg contours versus the population here, we'll be looking qualitatively. But I do do some quick drill down on the uh, on the two metrics that neither of us like, which are dice and dis max distance to agreement. Um, but that's because it was just easy. You'll see why I do it. Uh, it, it it gives them a degree of overlap. That's it. It should stop yeah, there. If yeah. you're off by a millimeter, you're going to get penalized the same as if you're off by 30. But let's talk about the metrics for a second. It was, what is it, 2022. So it was probably 2007, 2008. I introduced something called the structure metric, which was a dis. the farther you got away, you could set a penalty function. So it was specifically made to grade autoseg. <clears throat> Those were back in the days where the autoseg didn't work. So immediate impact people ran away because it was so it was showed that nothing worked essentially it did yep. show good correlation with predicting dvh differences that would be of alert this is in the red journal but i found it was for the human it was too sensitive so psychologically yep. and this was when it, even if you're not if you're judging human versus human or 
or you're studying student versus resident versus attending physician, for example, or specialist, it's so sensitive that the psycho psychology of it is it would freak people out. My score is so low. Well, yeah. that kind of is indicative of how important it is in radiation therapy with the gradients, but let's, let's go on these metrics a little bit. It, uh, there's, I think we should keep working on this. Um, whether it's a modified dice with a certain tolerance distance, I see a lot of people using what's the distance where not, there's 95% agreement. What are some what are some of your favorite quantified metrics, even if there's not one that you say this is the gold standard? What what which ones do you like or do you find useful? So there's a, a couple that have been published recently. Uh, one by Google DeepMind, which they called Surface Dice. Um, and another one that's published uh, by Mastro, but you might find I'm a co-author, so therefore I'm a little bit biased on this one, uh, called Added Path Length. And um, both of those take into account a tolerance. Now the surface dice says it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the good chance is if you're in the middle of the structure, you're just going to get it right. You know, uh, dice's standard volumetric dice is, is biased on volume. If, if you have a large structure, because most of the middle is just bound to be right, you're going to get a high score anyway. So surface dice basically looks at the amount of surface agreement that you have as opposed to volumetric agreement. But they also added a tolerance to say, well, if you're within one millimeter on the surface, that's that's close enough. Um, and you could set that tolerance. The added path length measure is very similar, except it, it assumes that you're doing slice by slice editing. And the question is, is how much how much contour do I need to draw? to make it whatever I'm editing correct to my opinion. Um, and that metric is, is not symmetric because it's assuming that if you're editing, say you're using a paintbrush, you're drawing new contour in, that's effectively doing the deletion at the same time. So it doesn't penalize deletion. So if you say contour the spinal cord to too great an extent, you won't get penalized for having to delete slices. That should be a, a fairly quick process. But if you haven't contoured it far enough and you have to draw lots of slices, you do get penalized. Hmm. Um, and, and the added path length paper and uh, a follow-up papers reproduced this result has shown that that metric corresponds pretty well to editing time in clinical practice. So I think your comments on the sure struct uh, measure were, were interesting to me because I think it depends on, on what you want to do clinically. What are you trying to test clinically? And your sure struct measure is saying, you know, you've got correlation to dosimetric impact. And the added path length has correlation to editing. That's fascinating. That was, yeah, that's that's important. Yeah, the and it also depends on what endpoint. Hey, I did see a glass of wine. I love it. Yeah, I, yeah it, no, I, it's nine o'clock in 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 Oxford, everyone. Nine p.m. on a Saturday. Again, uh, he is allowed I, I and encouraged. See, uh, <laughs> um, an internet meme saying that you, you, you know, one trick is to have your wine in a in a mug. And if you blow on it occasionally, everyone just assumes it's coffee. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm not I'm not here to deceive anyone, so I'll, I'll go straight with the honesty. If it was nine if it was nine a.m. on a Saturday, I wouldn't hold it against you. Um, Maybe the, it even makes the discussion better. It also depends on the endpoints we're looking at. You know, the, the ultimately what people are judging are the DVHs, and it, I, I've always found it interesting. Is it's the word, the diplomatic word I'll use, that people will look at the DVH and say, "I want to get this one percent under the tolerance," and not realize even a couple millimeters on the contour would make that DVH go, you know, and so go into the tolerance, yeah. I always thought, now this is a little bit crazy, and so we won't talk about it much, but <clears throat> I invented this thing called feasibility analysis for a product called Plan IQ. It's a way to kind of say what's possible for any given target structure, what's the possible sparing. And so I was working a lot with what are the maximum possible gradients allowed in radiation therapy for external beam. And then I started thinking, wouldn't this be interesting if we, for OARs, we painted a maximum possible sparing gradient all the way around it, and then we said, what's the implication of how the DVH changes as the contour changes? So you might start to see that, it, in other words, it's DVH sensitivity we might want to be looking at, but that's it's a little hard to do because every treatment plan is a little different. But treatment plans 
start to have a pattern, especially in the age of VMAT, they start to have a pattern that's quite predictable as well. It's things we should think, keep thinking about because really to judge what is what is really good or good enough is imperative to validating AI. And AI, I'm starting to see, is our only chance of driving out variation in contouring, which will have a, a, an exponential effect on plan quality, a, a, a huge impact on plan quality. I'm, so I am but fully I behind those, all that, of your efforts here. That those, those endpoints are, are really interesting as well, because you, you know, if we're judging those, generally that's come from a plan that's taken into account the contours in the first place right and and if a clinician's edited the contours to some extent their choice of right is going to affect the plan now how much they've edited and, and the sensitivity of the contour to that plan starts to matter but if they are editing or not um to them the auto contour is is efficiency and if they have to edit it's a pain now, if we take away any editing, uh, which you know are indications for use in FDA clearance, so you can't do, so right, don't do right, it. Right. Uh, but if you take that away, then we get into well, what is the impact of any errors in AI on dose? And I think there's there's quite a few studies out there, and one that um, again Mastro Clinic have done. So actually, for most things except where there's high gross um, high dose gradients. It doesn't matter. So you, you're kind of wasting your time editing contours miles away from the target. It depends. You could, if there are volumetric DVH that you have a volume that's much bigger or much, much smaller, even mm -hmm. in the low gradient regions, that's going to impact the shape of your DVH a lot. I mean, even think about the mean. The mean is going to be affected a lot if, uh, if you draw a lot bigger or a lot smaller, even out, and, and, and even out of harm's way. And, and that's where things like dice maybe have meaning or maybe sure stroked because you're you're looking at volume. Yeah. But it, but if you're tweaking a contour by you know half a millimeter on one slice, yeah, that's you're, right. You're affecting the volume that much. Now in a in a in a we dimming quality world, it would say that any error could potentially be a bad error, and so try to drive it out as much as possible. So again, I think really AI is by definition going to be consistent. If I think the challenge with AI that we this is part of kind of why the mission I want to do all this, if if we can get the industry, if we can help the industry come up with ways to say what is good or better, then we have made it much easier for companies like you to validate versus good or better and drive out the yep. variation because now the, the robot is doing the work. You had another, um, I, I'm, the, the, the other thing you brought up and then I promise we'll jump into the data. But this is <laughs> this is interesting. I I meet very few people that are interested in uh, contouring metrics as you, so I'm gonna take advantage of this. Um, <laughs> the humans judging humans versus human judging autoseg is fascinating. So how much the, it, what you described was people would be critical of autoseg. That almost to me, I wonder if that's regional in nature or if there's something, because you might want to criticize the robot because you know it doesn't have feelings. There may be a psychology that are they replacing me. But overall, I think if we get people to accept that that contouring takes too long and we're, we, have few, we have less bandwidth for throughput, the automation and the quickness is a good thing. We ought to all be cheering for autoseg, but we should require it's correct. So when you see people being critical of autoseg, do you is it correlated with a reluctance to accept it, or is it just more of a you know some kind of psychological thing going on here? I, I, there's so much psychology in it uh, that th this is where you, you just open the can of worms. Really, you know, it, there are several factors. People are critical because they've had bad experience in the past. You know, I, I bought I bought an app was contouring that was rubbish. So my prior on auto segmentation is it must be rubbish, and because that's my prior bias, I'm now going to criticize it to prove that I was right to have that bias. That, or there's, yeah. as you say, the, the fear of job replacement. This, you know, <laughs> if I think this auto segmentation is going to come and take my job, I'm I'm going to prove it's wrong. Um, so, you know, there's several reasons why people might be biased. Now, equally, if you if you have to look at auto segmentation and you're saying, you know, auto segmentation is the way forward for consistency, etc., you might have to bias the other way. Um, 
you know, I think this is good enough because I want it to be good enough. I mean, you, on the acceptance question, I, I also think there's there's a certain amount of how you phrase the question. So uh, on the, the Turing test website that we set up, we um, we phrased it, if you are uh, QA'd, you're asked to QA this contour by a colleague, would you, you know, accept it, send them minor comments, you know, or, or send it back and tell them to start again, um, and put it in that phrase of, you're asking somebody else to do work. It's not just saying this is wrong or right. Oh yeah. It's like what what is the the effort you're you're prepared to say? Are you going to send it to your colleague and tell them that they need to put more effort in because it's not good enough? Um, which changes the question because if you're saying is this is this good enough? It's it's really easy to say no. It's not good enough. Make it better. But if you think about the effort, then you think okay, well maybe maybe I'm prepared to accept it. That is a very good point. It reminds me of something. Uh, I forget what it was. It's, it was kind of a a cheesy documentary series that was quite like a, a not well produced documentary series with excellent content. And I forget what it was called. It was kind of uh, the history of computers going through not only the origin of Microsoft, but Apple, et cetera. One of the things was when like spreadsheet applications first started coming out it freaked accountants out they thought if people can have spreadsheets they don't need us anymore what they realized quickly was that oh my gosh with spreadsheets we can do so much more work we can increase our clients by a factor of 10 and charge them less and ha and make a lot more and they ended up doing a lot better that's the way it's going to happen in radiation therapy we know it so if we can help the psychology of really everybody should be cheering for accuracy and speed I think we're in good shape. And, and I, I do start to get that impression. Um, so I think we're headed in the right direction, especially with companies like yours doing the work. So without further ado, are you uh, are you ready to jump in? So just as everyone, if you've watched, uh, we, we've, we've done interviews now. This is the third of three I'll do with AI vendors. So this is Murata Medical. Mark, if you want to describe, we've talked a bunch about this, so I won't make you do a demo. If you want to describe conceptually what the user does, or does the user do anything when they're using Murata uh, auto segmentation? Uh, the question is, is, who's the user? Okay. Um, uh, so I mean, uh, yeah, it, it, there are there are multiple people involved in the radiotherapy planning process. The way we've set up our system is, it's a black box server, sits in a cupboard set up DICOM routing from your CT simulator. So the scan gets taken and the person at the scanner console is either sending off to the packs or, you know, your RT packs. And, and they can also send it off to the Murata workflow box, which sits in the cupboard, just DICOM push. Um, could be also, you know, automated if you, you set up your RT packs to automatically push it there. It then auto contours the study and it will then do a DICOM push back to wherever you've configured it. So, you know, from the, from the scanner console perspective, that particular user doesn't really have to do any extra work other than they're already doing. Then the dosimetrist or the radonc who are gonna do the contouring, they sit down at their treatment planning system where the data is, a little bit of extra work, maybe depending on the TPS, they have to load in a structure set as well as the CT. And, you know, in, in most uh, planning practiced, the, the, you know, it's not like the patients on the CT simulator and the radonx tapping their fingers waiting for the CT to arrive. So yeah, we assume the contours are gonna be there when the person sits down to contour and, and that's it. So that's why I was saying I, I didn't really wanna do a demo because yeah. it's boring. There's nothing yeah. to see. I think it's... you've described how everyone would describe their ideal auto segmentation. <laughs> First time we look at things, there are a bunch of contours already there, which we can add to, edit, et cetera. Let me, let me ask you this, uh, and you can tell me if I hit a sore spot, but I'm, I'm so interested. So are you able to get inside the adaptive workflow yet where you can go push to your machine and your server in the cupboard and then push immediately back if there is a patient on the table? So not, not 
online adaptive. Of course, that would require uh, models that support comb beam, but, but you know, conceptually. So, I mean, we, we've still got a deformable, uh, deformable registration based replanning workflow because actually deformable registration for for CT to CT is is still, you know, it's, it's really good. If it's the same patient, you're going to get great contours out of that. Um, so we still have a workflow for that. We don't really support the um, the online adaptive where you're you're sending the, the the CT. It will contour it. You send it back. And you quickly edit. You quickly replan and treat the patient. But in a, an adaptive workflow where you've got a cone beam CT, you've con you know, decided to replan. Again, you're doing a simulation CT. You have the you have the contours, and, and we've got that ability to do a full image registration based one or the AI based one. Oh, I got it. So the, um, if the inputs there are a, a new cone beam and the prior and the planning images contours, you will create a per fraction set of contours. Is that a... Exactly. Okay, yeah. perfect. Well, are you ready to start looking at some of your images? Yeah, I'm excited. To oh, see you should be excited. I, I haven't actually haven't looked at them. I, I verified it would load up. So we're both looking at this fresh. All right, I'm going to switch over to my screen here. All right, everyone, we have pulled up the RT structure set created by Murata, Mark's company. So we'll first take a look, and this is on the see-through arrow, case three, head next. We're going to focus just on the organs at risk. We can take a quick look at all of the structures that your engine created. It's, it's a long list here. Um, one, so people can take a look. There's, there are the outputs. We will be looking just at, um, in any order that Mark wants, Brainstem, left and right parotid, left and right submandibular gland, larynx and, uh, vaso and uh, constrictor muscles, pharynx constrictor muscles. Um, but if you want to speak real quick, this is a lot of outputs. One thing I noticed was you have these little uh, uh, suffixes on them. What do those initials mean? So, so those are uh, different models from different training databases. Okay. Uh, so those are on there. I mean, we, we have some duplication. From, from different training data sets with different clinics, et cetera, um, where maybe there's a different contouring style. So one approach we've got, because we've built several models for, for some organs, is that we can take a clinic's, um, yeah, a sample of their contours and say, which of these looks most like what you do? Now, this doesn't help with standardization. This this reinforces differences between clinics. It helps with uh, the transition, it, maybe. Uh, yeah, and 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 yeah. Hopefully, yeah. If people aren't happy with the result, then they're still not going to be using it. So it's better that they're consistent within their clinic as a starting point. Uh, so I mean, to run this case, I I've actually configured my my laptop to do all the processing uh, before you sent the case over for just the organs that you had on your video. And then you sent the case over and said, can you do everything that you've got? I'm like, ah, oh, panic. Uh, <laughs> so I just, I, I did a Daikon push to to our office where we got a, a machine set up for customer demos and then just like splat, everything's there. Uh, so that's what the, the suffixes are. Uh, there's a couple in red, which have got like lowercase without the suffixes, uh, which have been turned off by default um, because they're, they're structures that either people don't routinely want to see, don't ask for. Um, or say for the crotids, I mean, they work well where you've got contrast, as we had in this case, and they don't tend to work particularly well where you don't have contrast. Um, so I, I just switched on a few extra things just to, to have that. Oh, um, I, I think it's great. If anything, the watchers here can take a quick, hey, take a screen capture if you want. There's uh, <laughs> types of stuff you can get with the Murata magical, blo magical box. Um, all right, we are going to go organ by organ of the seven i think that we have to look at what do you want to start with i i think we should kick off with a product because all right left or right because i uh i think i think the right one was perhaps just a touch worse uh in my opinion i'm not a medical doctor so i could be wrong but yeah so if, right if we just look conceptually so here's what we're going to do uh we will turn Actually, we'll leave it off now. I'm going to load the consensus. <clears throat> As anyone who's watched this series of videos, um, I just load it up. I create a dose grid just so it can be read into any software. And by the way, uh, Murata, since you're doing this interview, Mark, Murata, you're more than welcome to, I'll give you all these 
those grids. If they're of any use to you, validation. Oh, they're really interesting. You yeah. bet. You get, you'll get all of them. So, and you can read them into your software because they are RT dose grids. Just ignore the gray. Instead of gray, it's a percent agreement. Yeah. So I th we're going to start. Let's do both parotids, and we'll start with the right, I think you said. So unfortunately, we have to wait for DVHs to calculate here because, <laughs> because it thinks it's a dose grid, but we won't look at them. Although, I tell you what, looking at the DVHs, uh, it's a really interesting thing to look at the D when you have multi-observer contours over a consensus grid. You can start to say, whoa, there's something we can interpret from here. You would mm -hmm. be interested in it. Uh, uh, right now, uh, we'll, we'll stay away because I'm afraid you and I would talk forever. So here's the population. And I tell you what, before we even look at your contours, I'll just fly through from the bottom to the top of the right parotid. So you can see here areas of high disagreement, areas of high agreement is how we look at it. And when you look at the consensus, you do start to kind of your eye leads you to the mid, the kind of somewhere in the middle lies the wisdom of the crowd. And we are now going to look at the Murata output. Aha, uh -huh. this is, okay, this is this is interesting. So let's go again from the bottom to the top and we'll let you kind of comment on anything you see. So we do see a little bit of a more conservative approach. I tell you what, I'm gonna turn on, uh, this looks like no one drew out here, but that's yeah. because the lowest value I have is 10%. Let me add a, 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 an, ISO, an ISO agreement line to that. So we can see the, tr the true union Let's see, let's just say if anybody contoured will show something blue. All right, so it does overlap. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and it's so cool to look at these because your uh, your model has learned, now it starts to look pretty normal. It, it, it's, it's kind of learned that, that shape that comes inside around the mandible uh -huh. a little bit. Uh, and I guess it goes as far as you know, the soft tissue there. Yep. So now we're seeing a really good shape. One thing I, I got to tell you, just aesthetically about AI, I love it because they're all smooth. I Doing a lot of plan and, studies and, and stuff, we get a lot of inputs that are just, first of all, sometimes they're blocky because the software exports blocky contours. Those are bad. But, you know, it's just sometimes they're jittery and you know the human body isn't jittery. And, and that's it. Uh, yeah. Typically, if people are doing slice to slice contouring, there tends to be a lot of variation in, in what they're doing. That 3D smoothness is, is more plausible, perhaps, from AI contouring. So I think here, you know, where, where you're tucking around the mandible, uh -huh. you know, we tend to get reasonably good agreement. Now, I, I, the reason I, I said, why don't we have a look at the right one? Because I've, I've noticed I had a quick scroll through before sending them over to you, just in case I was going to embarrass myself horrifically. Um, and I noticed that you know that that extension around the mandible goes really quite far anterior, and uh, well, and I think that's wrong. It, <laughs> so it, it depends on who I, you I, talk to. I'll 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 uh, I won't get one of your peers, uh, one of your AI peer companies out there, also agreed that this should be considered. So don't don't automatically just. We have to be careful when we look at consensus. It doesn't mean it's right. It means this is the current opinion. Well, it's also an interesting to see where one of the slices that the sort of dark blue did go right up the front there. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and so, and so, so some humans, small amount. at least there one human yeah. thought it was. And that what if and this is just conjecture, but what if that one human is right? I've said this in other videos. I'll say it again here just in case someone just watches this one. In an ideal world, the best way to judge contours would be to take a bunch of high quality retrospective clinical trials, recontour them, reproduce the DVHs, and then rerun your correlations to say which of the DVH predictive metrics became more predictive with the new contours. Does that make sense? That's the gold standard of how to judge whether a contour is useful or not. So in other words, if no clinical trials, which has human variation in it, almost all of them do by now, so if you if you recontour them, your DVHs are going to look different. In most cases, they're going to look worse because these are highly conformal. 
but that may lead the metrics like a volume metric or a dose metric min max mean somewhere in between if it becomes more predictive even if it's telling you bad news you know if it becomes more predictive it means your contour was more useful yeah so yeah, i wouldn't automatically respectively yeah and, and and show that it made a difference that would be i mean yeah that would be the holy grail That's in the terms holy of grail. showing that yeah. Well, we're we're starting it now. Well, I tell you what, we do this fun little thing here where we say, how much do you agree with the population and at what ISO agreement level? I think you're going to have a good agreement with the population here. I think it's going to be at a lower ISO agreement level, low meaning the the uh, the bigger extents. So almost the union of opinions, if that makes sense. So here we do this. And I have to apologize again. I, I we're going with dice, but okay. <laughs> this is for, your the your maximum degree of overlap in terms of dice. I apologize. 0 0.908. That's pretty high. It's a high overlap. You're overlapping with the uh, the population 42. Let's just call it 43 percent. That's pretty reasonable. That's, yeah, that being on, I guess on the on the low side, saying more more people. That's right. As you say, slightly wider. Uh, but it, it, it's not extreme in, in terms of agreeing with the the worst case. Or not at all. I think. Yeah. And this would be one where the, the max distance to agreement would probably be big because of that little wing up there. But look, look, I mean, just yeah. look at the sagittal here. And I apologize for my poor quality of your, your rendering. But uh, this is following the consensus gradient. There are a couple regions where and this is where we were talking about where uh, your algorithm went outside but otherwise if we just qualitatively look you are in the band of what and the, 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 i should also just respecify this population is specifically radiation oncologists this doesn't include dosimetrists or any physicists or anything so it's a it's a, a well curated data set let's do the left let's see if uh are we ready for that one it's, it's a couple a couple more comments on this sure. i think it's interesting on the the axial uh, that uh, you know, at least one person has gone over what appears to be the mandible, and that that was one of the criticisms actually that that led me to do the the whole Turing test thing was that you know they're like, what, why has it gone over the mandible? It's like because you do. Interesting. That's why. And I th and the, the other thing I thought maybe maybe now is a good time to mention it. the the study we've done of how people edit our auto contouring in clinical practice. Um, and, you know, we can look at this later, but it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, the variation is around the mandible and as we say, maybe, maybe how far to extend anteriorly. Um, maybe we'll come back to that later and I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Oh that. yeah. If we have time. Uh, nice rendering. Yeah. Breaking away here, it turns out Mark and Murata have this interesting little tool that helps kind of uh, tell where people do manual editing after autoseg. Our theory here is this is going to overlap a lot with, with where the consensus starts disagreeing, which makes sense. Mark, can you explain us a little bit what we're looking at? Yeah, so we've got a, a couple of images here. On the left-hand side, we've got the median amount of editing, and the right-hand side is the 10 to 90 percentile range of the amount of editing. So what we've done here is we've taken uh, clinical cases uh, over a period of one year from a clinic and looked at the amount of editing that was done to the AI auto segmentation compared to the, you know, the resultant approved clinical contour. Now, obviously, they're, they're all on different patients, so it's really hard to do the analysis. And then we've done a shape-based registration to map all of those edits back to a arbitrarily chosen reference patient. Um, so this is this is for the right parotid. And uh, there you go. So we can see the parotid there. So red here means more editing. Blues, well, blues negative editing. Red's actually extending. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you see for the majority of the product, the median is actually no editing. And we can see that actually the, where we do get some editing is tends to be to extend that that protid. And, and this is the, again, that uh, anterior sort of tip going along. And we also get it just on a little bit of extension going around the mandible. So just to say the obvious, then, the big red region is exactly what we just saw when we looked at your, yours versus 
the consensus we saw oh, it's, it's slightly i mean although this is saying on on average we or the clinicians have to add a little bit more oh that's it, yeah take stamp off. but what it is is this diff this completely independent way to look i think so this is auto seg and then where do they change it that should have a correlation intuitively with where we see a consensus start to have more variation because people are going to disagree in those regions and i think that's the point that's what we're seeing this is a really neat so you and yeah so on the right hand side shows that variation mm -hmm. this is this is the 10 to 90 percentile range of the amount of editing so actually that's it you get the biggest variation on whether we need to edit or not and I think um, again, the the colors point us to the parts that we should be talking the most about in terms of what's what should yeah. we do when we all when on um, someday when we all agree, what will we agree on? And, and yeah, the reason we're we're doing this is to say, well, are there areas where we've got systematic errors where all the clinicians agree we should do something different, um, or for all patients? If we've got systematic errors, there's something that us as an AI vendor can fix. We can address that problem. If we've got uh, essentially random errors going on, yeah, there's a lot of variation between users, between patients, um, but there's really low average editing. There's, there's nothing that we can do. This really falls to the clinical community to go, what, what do we want? That's amazing uh, method for continual improvement. Really smart, really smart. Yeah, thanks for showing us that. I, back to your uh, one question, I should have asked it before, your, your Turing test, when you show people the A versus B, are you asking them to say, which one do you like better or which one do you think a robot did? So I've got, I've got three different questions I put up on that website. One is, is this human or computer? And okay. it just shows one picture. Yeah, what do you think drew this? Have a side by side saying, which do you prefer? And then another single image, which is that, that sort of QA question of if you asked to QA it, would you send it back or would you, you accept it? That is so smart. That's publicly available or is it just a Murata customers? No, uh, autocontouring.com. Hey, let's um, give it a plug. Let's give it a plug here. Why not? I, I better check that. Uh, <laughs> you can check that. The, it's where, where it's like the server's going to be down because... See, like, uh, well, hey, I'll cut it out. If I'll, I'll edit it out. Don't worry. I'll take care of you. So autocontouring.com. There you go. So, um, oh, you, you I need to, to be a user. Sorry. All right. I won't waste it. I'm going to try this later. But hey, just a plug for autocontouring.com. All that cool stuff you just heard Mark describe. You can do that here. Um, neat. That, do they get medical, to medical physics? And do you let people submit their own image sets and say, hey, I want I want to do mine. I want to see my image set. And you kind of they submit I, data. I, I haven't got that far. I want to get that far. I, I think it would be a really useful thing just to have as a generic tool. Sure would. All right. We're looking at the left parotid here. The uh, green, dark, beautiful, smooth green line there. Murata. We'll go again. I'll, let me start down at the bottom. And if, if we kind of take a look at the consensus, you can see there started to be a lot of disagreement or more and more disagreement as you get superior. So we, we will. But it's quite interesting. I mean, you, you, you've got 100% contours, really quite small. It's very small, surprisingly. But, small. but once you get up to the 90%, yeah. Yeah, the agreement's not bad. In this case, the sample size was small enough, let's say 70. So the 100% really is all 70. So the 90 is still... But, but I, I agree, um, a lot of people stop contouring and contour just a very small volume. And, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but 10% can be a lot. So here we go, we're looking really nice here in terms of in the bands of where you would kind of expect things to be. So uh, yeah, no surprises on this one, no little wing things. Wow. No, and, and, and that's where, I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked at the image in detail. I wonder what it is about the right versus the left that yeah, I mean, oh. it extended anteriorly on the on the right and not the left. Something you can take a look at then. So I think if we yeah. do, I bet we'll have even a higher max agreement with one of the. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah, guessing you know point nine five. Oh, okay. If we get a point nine five, that'll be the highest I've seen over all of these. So I think the highest we've seen so far is a point nine three three. Here we go. Nine three two. Oh, you were one one thousandth off. Interestingly enough, almost the same ISO agreement level. We shouldn't be yep. surprised by that. It's a robot. 
So 932 and at matching the 41%. Uh, again, very comforting, encouraging, et cetera. So beautiful. All right, what next? Let's have a look at pharyngeal constrictors. Oh, I think boy, that, that was you, are, there. you are a brave man. Just jump right into that, huh? Well, I, I mean, <laughs> having, having watched your first video, you know, that's that's where the massive variation was. Um, Here we go. Let, let's, uh, let's bring it on. Your wish is my command. It is massive variation uh, between the hum amongst the humans. Um, but... By the way, I, I won't do it publicly. I will do it privately. Uh, I, the AI versus AI versus AI versus consensus for these highly variable things like the constrictors tends to be much higher agreement than humans. I find that also very encouraging, not only for AI, but the usefulness of consensus as some kind of standard to judge against. All righty, uh, let me find that. So again, we'll look just at the population. So I mean, you, you had in, in your original video that it, there's quite a lot of variation. I mean, both all over the place, isn't it really? All over. This is an interesting, because it's a shape that's kind of a flat thing that wraps. And so people are kind of in the right area or in the same area. But within this is something where the dice fails catastrophically, I think, because you'll get really low dice numbers, even though you may just be a little bit off. And the thinner you get, the smaller you get. Dice tends to be even less useful. If, it's, it's really sensitive yeah. on the volume. So it's, yeah. So here's the population. So when we look at the, and we trim out the if if I turn on the uh, the bottom ten percent, so kind of put on the union. I'll do that again. It's, you start to see some of the craziness as we get superior. Uh, otherwise, you know, the cloud is kind of in the same spot. We're going up, we're going up. Now we start to see it's a lot of- It's interesting how much they wrap around, yeah. yeah. And especially where you've got the disease on the on the right-hand side. That's right. And it's like, I, I find this fascinating because it's a, yeah, as a structure, it's hard to see in a lot of places. You're kind of making assumptions about where it is a lot of the time. Yep. So one thing here, we're looking, now we've turned yours on, the red. One thing is the population, some of the population, let's say 30, 40% goes a bit, let's see, the, high, the yeah. first slice, we see anybody contours 57. Again, not a lot of people contoured there. Here we're up to over 50%. Now we see, so 2.7 centimeters away. Uh, just I, I, for some of these, the superior and inferior, where we start, where we stop, tends to be the high degree of variation. That probably is more, can be handled more with training and expectations. Now we start to see your contour overlapping quite reasonably with this. And, very, and, and symmetric. The population here made it asymmetric because of what you said earlier. Yeah, and I think that's a, you have the disease there. Right. And... AI yeah, has the potential to learn around disease, but because yeah. disease varies from patient to patient, you're going to need a lot more data. And, better, and better you contour it and let people cut it out if they want than to not contour it and make them do the work of yeah. finding it. Uh, uh, yeah, if, you, if you're drawing the GTB as well, it's, yeah. it's a simple Boolean operation. Right. So now we're, we're in the less variable region and you're smack dab on top. Oh, look at there. I mean, we're... This starts to be very promising down here that people are agreeing, AI is agreeing. Now a little bit at the inferior edge, you stop, let's see, at minus 57, the population stop. So again, two, two centimeters or so. Let's see, now we're gonna have our maximum agreement here is gonna be the lowest of all the organs, of course, but let's see how high we can get and at what, at, at what agreement level. Okay, 0.683, so it's still not that, it, it, and it's nice, nice. It's still consistent at which, wow. which sort of agreement level. That is that is very interesting. That's a trend I haven't seen so far. Even when I did the experts versus uh, consensus, they would have ISO agreement levels of high agreement, but they they weren't. Maybe it would could be consistent left versus right bilateral organs, but not necessarily for different organs. Here we've seen, we've done, we're kind of three for three where you being in the 40 to 45 range. So we'll keep an eye on that. 
so that is definitely an interesting structure there and i think i mean when you look at it in 3d it's certainly very reasonable very smooth and even if people wanted to make edits it's it's a, certainly a good starting point and i think yeah it's, it's that inferior uh and uh, superior extent question right um i forget which structure said above and below this um but again it's, it's you know, where, where do you chop something that stretches a long way right probably I if, think if we of... if we took a section out of the middle and re-ran what's your max overlap it might jump up to a, like a point seven, point eight, or point you know point eight at least and again the challenge with dice is yeah is that factor yeah. um i i guess what i, I thought was interesting where, where you showed on on your first video that all, all the different experts uh and i noticed one of them was charlotte brower and I would love to see how this compares to hers. Well, we can. We can. <laughs> because, you want to? Because it, hey, well, this. You this, want to? And, yeah, yeah. Let's. We let's can do, do it. Uh, just... I need to pull down. Oh no! No. Uh, let's see. Okay, because I did all these analyses. I, I am actually going to do that. That actually. Okay, I'm going to prime the pump here. I sent you an email. I'm. I let all the experts who did this particular panel. There were four of them. I let all of them opt in to, hey, do you want to get quantified comparisons, you versus AI and you versus consensus? They all opted in. I'm letting the AI vendors do the same. So you just, so if you'd like to see that, I will produce all those results for you. I'm going to make a short podcast just showing those charts. So you'll have, I'm not going to compare AI to AI. I'm going to compare physicians versus consensus and, and then, and each AI engine and then AI versus consensus. I'm making these kind of color coded charts, kind of a grid. And so I'll, I'll let you know the result of that. And then you can decide whether you want your results to be private. But I think that's a great hypothesis is probably true. And you'll, you'll have numbers to look up and, and certainly something we've seen is it's also interesting to look which physicians agree with each other or do any of them. And, you know, you see green and orange and yellow based on which of the experts match different experts. And that I think is a good conversation for them to have. Um, and I've been really interesting in, in, in terms of whether they've uh, whether they've worked together or whether there's been over, any overlap in terms of uh, not necessarily them directly working, but in terms of staff that you know both both worked with it training or or, or yeah. trained on protocols. Yeah, uh, they're all interesting questions. I, I I can't believe I finally found someone who's interested in to this level <laughs> that I am. I, I kind of feel sorry for Some, both of us, but we need to be doing this. Um, let's at jump. At some point when we can meet face to face yeah. at a conference, we can go out for a beer and uh, right. save boring the rest of the world over our, sounds, our obsessions. Sounds great. <laughs> I'm still hoping there's a small audience of intensely interested people out there. So even if it's just the AI vendors, everyone, there's a lot to benefit from these discussions. Let's do um, j uh, just keeping track of time here let's do you want to do the submandibulars or the larynx next i think we can do the uh, it's up to you i mean it's, it's, i don't mind larynx okay you were brave that, that's another hard it's one. another hard one so let's do that one uh well i tell you what let since we let's take a breather here with the submandibular and i'll go to the left because that's the one that's less variable showed less variation because it was yeah. uh, contralateral because it's away from the disease yeah so i bet we see some remarkable unremarkable results here if that makes sense some nice relaxed comforting look how beautiful this is results all right here's the population kind of move in the middle of it nice uh, relatively consistent yeah Blob. i believe this of all organs have had the lowest variation even lower than the brainstem the uh, left submandibular gland had the lowest variation i mean even if you just look this is a pretty nice consensus saying other than at the superior yeah. edge we've got pretty good agreement so let's take a look now we just have to turn on there we go so do a quick fly through we're looking at the cyan of course you can hardly see it because it's overlapping that gradient that surface agreement we should call it so i bet we're easily above 0.9 again on our max agreement up oh, close 0.883 again at you know you've been all in the 40 to 50 percent range yeah let's go over on the right and see if there's any less 
Let, well, let's just see how it, how it how it goes there. So we'll go ahead and turn yours on. And again, I said it earlier, but to remind you, all these grids um, I'll distribute to you. You get a lot, lot more variation going on there. Yeah. Now, oh, here, here we go. Whoa, we got something here going the AI on. The AI yeah. went off on one because clearly there's, you know, that's an underrepresented appearance in our in our training data set of having that really big lymph node. Oh, interesting. Right next to it. Yeah, look at that. So well, that that's good. You You learned something from this. So we're already... Or you can, you learn. Well, and, and, and an this is really, perhaps. yeah, and, and and this is where it's yeah. The challenge with AI is where you get something that it hasn't seen before. You don't actually know what it's going to do. Um, yeah, and if you even if we we threw this case into our training data set, and it's you know one in five hundred. It's not enough, is it? It's not enough, and yeah. and, and therefore. AI is going to work, yeah, 90, 95% of the time on, on all the standard things. And, and where disease is, where unusual artifacts are, um, you yeah, know, that strange patient with three heads, uh, it's going to do something a little bit wrong. And, and that's, that's one of the risks that I think you know, has been put forward around AI, is that question of de-skilling. You know, it, AI will build consistency and we can use it, we can trust it <laughs> most of the time, but you don't want people to become so reliant on it. They don't check, that they don't edit, if if it's clearly you know, not seen something before. Yeah. Well, but that, that that's where I think it doesn't replace jobs because actually uh, you, you need those people who really know what they're doing to go, in this case, I, I need to do something about it. Well, certainly to see this, uh, is probably easy to inspect and find and a lot easier to edit than if you were just contouring from scratch. That's why it's still probably all said and done fast. I think you mentioned the thing that we have to make sure as an industry is we don't just adopt it and say, well, it's a robot now, just trust it. And yeah. and that's exactly what you're saying. When you do a, a deep learning engine, is there any kind of dampener you can put on? This is the type of shape we expect. And when you get a shape that looks like this, you might trim it up so to speak I mean, does that make sense what i'm saying yeah so i mean various people have, have looked to trying to integrate shape modeling within ai and and you know i've seen some interesting work there but you inherently then start to bias towards a sort of mean average shape and so the ai might be doing the right thing you know that that question of how far anteriorly should we extend on the parotid it's, you know, atlas contouring wasn't so bad at parotids uh, if you do multi-atlas contouring, but multi-atlas contouring had a, a, a habit of just smoothing things off and it would tend to chop off that anterior sort of tail of the parotid. And I think that's what, if you, if you start to say, I expect it to look like this shape, then you have the risk that it's, um, it's gonna make it look like that shape even when it shouldn't. That's a good point. That's a really good point. So, uh, the, but this, I think this is a great and important part of this conversation is it's it's not like uh, auto segmentation for radiation therapy is is done. It's going to be continually improving over the years, just like back in the day where we had dose calc, uh, Clarkson calculation. Yeah, and, and, and that's how I, I, I think I've done more research in a way since we've released this than we had to do to release this um, because getting something that was good was you know good enough was relatively straightforward Makes then sense. taking that next step understanding really how it happens on a you know a day in day out basis getting that post-market surveillance kind of side of things going that's that's where the challenges start to creep in sure uh, and the question about what's right it's just it's always there it's always there but uh, as long as we're asking it uh here we get something not surprising at all we got a very tame looking brainstem yeah it's interesting the variability uh, on the on the, yep. the experts here um and particularly on the 
inferior aspect. That is, I think, one of the more surprising things is because people think this is, uh, there's no variation in the brainstem. Well, there is an inferior and, and to a certain extent superior. Where does it start? Where does it end? If you look at any, even within axial slices, yeah. how big is it? And you see your contour right in the middle. So let's do, I think we're going to be back up to a high number here. Yep. Yeah, 0.914. Here, you're a little bit, on, you're on the other side of 50. Tighter. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what, um, just curious, it's, let's hide that away. Ah, okay. I'm still from NL04, which is, I was just wondering if that was uh, going to be from a different, different data set, but it's quite hard to see in this case. It is. And it, but here you get, a, a, I think people can get yeah. more of an appreciation for AI. It's not like the pixels alone tell you much here. <laughs> There's art built into AI. We're emulating humans. I mean, we understand that. Uh, and then how, how do we emulate humans when, when humans have different opinions? I often say we talk like contouring is a, is a step in a process, but the step in the process is more like making chili out there. People, you can have a lot of good tasting chilies, even though they're very different. I, I will die on the hill saying we can't have 10 physicians have 10 different opinions of an organ and have them all be right. Um, yeah. I, I think. And, and, and I think everyone acknowledges they can't all be right. The trouble <laughs> is every one of them thinks they are. That's right. <laughs> well, we're talking about it and showing these pictures. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to be an optimist on this. And, and uh, so this was very high agreement with, uh, you know, this time over 50%. So, no real surprises. Let's do one more where we did see the very high disagreement amongst the population. We will end up with the larynx. So again, population alone just all over the place yeah on any one axial slice i'm not there were some differences there i think here it's more of there are different sub thing. i think i don't know if the instructions weren't specific enough or if they were specific and no one looked at the instructions or if they were referring to protocols that people didn't know or weren't reading i'm not sure but i think a lot of this is more about uh just tendencies so let's now take a look I, I mean, I think the, oh, wow, guidelines are really guidelines are an interesting subject because you know we've we've done a lot of work looking at guidelines to try and make our, our auto contouring adhere to them as well as possible, and there's some remarkable ambiguity in guidelines. For About sure. the time we we first released this, uh, as I said we we worked with Charlotte Brower training training the head and necks OARs with Groningen. Uh, and there was a group at Google DeepMind who were working on something similar. And they they put some data on TCIA. And we found that we we weren't performing as well as they were against their data, but we were performing as well as they were against our test data from the same clinic. And I think the main difference was, you know, and, and they were nominally following the same guidelines, but I think how you interpret those guidelines, where there's slight ambiguity in Yep. in the way things are phrased there's leads to quite a lot of variation yeah, it's, it's it's not just variation in how people draw or what people see on the screen it's how they have if and how they've read the so-called instructions that's a, that's a great point yeah here is an a, i think this is a very interesting result here because you 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 are tightly fitting around the kind of let's get tendency to be more the union of all opinions a very conservative yeah and that this is uh, so we're going to get, I think, a very high overlap with a with smaller ISO agreement, which means a union of more. So let's. Oh, wow. OK, so, yeah, 0. 0.920 overlap with the 17.7. That's very that's very interesting. So the technique you've done or how you've trained is. Is agreeing with the people who also drew out there, obviously. So, again, it's more of a. You, your your algorithm, your engine will probably do whatever it's trained to do. So this just reinforces for me what is the right thing. Yeah, and and and, and then that comes down to 
how do you train these things? Yeah. I mean, er, early on, we, we worked with individual clinics, individual experts, uh, getting data from the clinic, um, have a conversation with a radiation oncologist. He said, it's great. It's going to going to make people more consistent. And uh, I'm like, yeah, but consistent with what? And they're like, well, with me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I think there's a certain amount uh, those leading institutions want want to train it because they they believe they're right i mean, but then as i said you know we, we've got three three different models represented in that data that, that, that set of contours um and, and we have multiple structures for the same thing for different opinions so how are we gonna how are we gonna bring consensus to the market if we're selling lots of different models now it allows us to to make people happy because they get contours like they want, but it doesn't bring consensus. So, you know, now we also have a, a team of in-house dosimetrists who who are doing some really meticulous contouring, and and you know they're discussing the guidelines between them. They're getting expert opinion, and they're really trying to build what they believe to be right is. Um, but by also doing a lot of peer review, just to make sure that every case has been checked. Um, because that's the other factor where, we, where we've taken clinical data. You've just got that inter-observer variation. It's not necessarily been peer reviewed carefully. Um, how much are we just training off, off noise? And, and we end up with, you know, I'm, I'm pleased it generally agrees with the consensus and it probably does because it averages out some of yeah. that noise back to the consensus. Yeah, some of the uh, individualism gets probably for the most part in a good way, gets uh, rounded out when we look at consensus. That, I think the um, the wild card there might be, are there some genius anatomists out there who are drawing something that no one else is that should be drawn or, or vice versa, they're not drawing something. So we should not throw out outliers as a rule when it comes to contouring. That's- No, and, and, and going to your, your point about clinical trials, what we want are the contours that have the best outcomes for the patient. Those ones that yeah. if you conform around yeah. them or to them, produce the best outcomes. That's the guide. And I think we have enough. So all clinical trials, in my opinion, as a little bit of a soapbox, um, have huge error bars even still, most because of the contouring. Yeah. Okay, the ability to calculate a dose accurately for the last 15, 20 years has been went from pretty good to really good. The ability to deliver a highly conformal dose, especially with VMAT, went from really bad in 2000-ish to good by 2010 to excellent now, especially in the days where we're tuning machines to match each other. Everyone can get a beam model. So now we're coming down to, we've driven out variation there. They, we've never driven out the variation in the contouring, which is the blueprint for all of it. Going back retrospectively and running AI contours until you get really maximizing the correlation with outcomes based on DVH. That to me is a really, really, it's a doable project. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe Murata I mean, I, can get I, involved I, in some of those. I, I'd love to be in something like that, you know, but I, 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 the bit that makes it hardest to do actually comes down to data access, data sharing, permissions, all of that data governance. It's Technically, I think these things are possible and, and setting up data agreements prospectively in, in advance is possible. But going back and saying, actually, there's this data from the clinical trial. So well, we haven't consented them for that. We've got 16 different PIs we have to consult. Then it becomes too hard. And yeah, it's <laughs> unfortunate the red tape can get in, get in the yeah, way of progress, absolutely. but we have to keep asking. I mean, the other thing is uh, I've been able to, thankfully, some clinical, you can get the data but there's, and they're scrubbed, but still usable, but you can't get access then to the outcomes data. You yeah, can get maybe yeah, exactly. the DICOM files and you can look at these things and you can, but yeah, you don't have that other thing you need. But now in the era of big data and uh, uh, you could probably within any one institution do this, if they've been tracking outcomes, you, what what's the required in you could probably start figuring some things out as low as 50 or 100 so i would encourage even individual institutions if to to get hopefully they've been tracking their outcomes engage with one of these ai vendors or all of them and say we're going to do this study because those are the studies our industry needs and it makes me so excited that it that 
I'm excited now because I'm seeing how good AI is, and so it's only going to get better. This now opens a whole new door to quality that so far we've been kind of keeping locked. Yeah, but yeah, it's exciting. Listen, Mark, this has been a pleasure. Uh, you have a uh, you've thought deeply about all this for all these years. Uh, uh, you're a great. Uh, resource for our industry. So, you want? Do you have any more parting words for uh, your community uh, out there? Well, I'll, I'll do a quick plug. Uh, great book. Might have my name on the bottom. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, so, so that I, I've done a whole chapter on uh, validation of auto contouring. I mean, yeah, it's it's very much retrospective. This is what people have done in the past. Um, hasn't gone as far as some of the the more exciting things we've been discussing today um but if you're interested in validation or you want to know what people have done and, and, and what stacks up and what doesn't have a look at that chapter i want to plug um, it a little more hold it up again and read us the title and is there a digital form uh yeah auto segmentation in radiation oncology uh bold title with state of the art as a tagline because that instantly means we now have to do a version two uh, <laughs> edited by uh Ying Zong Yang, Greg Sharp, and myself. Uh, so this this comes from the uh, AAPM Thoracic Contouring Challenge from 2017, uh, which was really the turning point between Atlas and AI. Um, and so we asked all the chapter authors to, to take that data set and use that as the example throughout the book. So that's quite quite good. Um, yeah, there's there's the hardback version, uh, and there's also an ebook version available uh, from crc press awesome so everyone i hope you recognize this uh sometimes the the world-renowned experts are actually at the vendors we try and here's one of them hey mark it's been a pleasure you go enjoy the what's left of your saturday night yeah okay gonna get a refund cheers